Uh, welcome everyone to this new lecture of the SEPARO project. My name is David Agnes. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the Amsterdam Center for European Law and Governance. The event of today is part of a lecture series organized by SEPARO, which is a three-year research project on separation of powers in the 21st century European Union. And the project is a joint effort between the Amsterdam Center for European Law and Governance, the University of Amsterdam, the Eric Kastron Institute of International Law and Human Rights at the University of Helsinki, and the Center for European Research at the University of Gothenburg. And today's event is also organized together with the Amsterdam Center for European Studies, and in particular, the Migration Network of the University of Amsterdam. It is my pleasure to introduce the speakers of today. Uh, we're happy to have with us Natasha Zahn and Ariadna ripol servent to present a new paper they're working on, which is entitled Games Populist Play, How Populist Governance Governments Engender Deadlock in EU Politics. Um, Natasha Zaun is Assistant Professor in Migration Studies at the European Institute of the London School of Economics. Her research focuses primarily on EU public policy with a focus on migration, as well as international solidarity and refugee protection. And Ariadna ripol servent is Professor for Politics of the European Union at the Salzburg Center of European Union Studies at the Department of Political Science and Sociology at the University of Salzburg. Her main research interests are European integration, EU institutions, and she worked a lot in particular on the European Parliament, but also on informal decision-making processes on populism and Euroscepticism and EU asylum and migration policy. And it's nice to see the paper of today brings together these different strands of her research. Um, so without further ado, I would leave the floor to Ariadna, which I understand will begin the presentation. So Ariadna, the floor is yours. And thanks again to both of you for uh, uh, participating in this event. Thanks, Davide, for the introduction. And thanks uh, a lot for um, the invitation and for letting us present this paper. I'll, I'll start sharing the screen. What do I have it now here? So um, basically, this is a, a paper that uh, Natasha and I have been working on for for a while already now. Um, and of course, it's it's been a bit of like a work in progress because basically, even if um, if if this policy field is not really changing and what we are looking at is not really changing, even, events keep changing. And of course, we have new elections and new governments and so on. And so um, we have needed to adapt this paper uh, um, uh, bit by bit. And even now we are still kind of trying to make sense of it and trying to make sense of new developments. So, um, uh, we are very happy for any feedback that you can give, for any questions, um, uh, and this will help us also to kind of uh, think about it and bring it forward. So a, a bit, our point of departure was that both Natasha and I were kind of looking at, at the um, events that happened after 2015, so the refugee crisis, so both of us of course, have been working on asylum politics for, for a long time. Um, and the 2015 crisis was very important for both of us. But we also wanted to look at what happened after that, um, and especially the, 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 the chances to, to um, get some sort of policy change after this big kind of crisis external event. And what we uh, noticed is that there was uh, a lot of talks, a lot of uh, uh, a lot of discussions, both in uh, in member states, but also in the EU institutions, lots of new initiatives. But in the end, uh, we've seen that not that much has changed and that most of the initiatives that came after the crisis have ended up in deadlock. Um, and especially when it comes to, to Dublin, which is the, the Dublin regime, which is the, the court of the EU asylum policy, uh, this has been really impossible to change. and. Um, it's been very difficult to, to move this kind of uh, responsibility shifting. So this idea that uh, basically um, those who are at the borders of the European Union should take care of for asylum seekers um, and those who do not uh, get them, then um, they, they, they don't want to do anything. And so this, this move towards responsibility sharing has not happened. And 
continues to be a very um, hot issue and very difficult to find agreement even today, nowadays uh, in, in 2021, right? So we are now six years after the, the crisis and not really much has happened. So what we want to then do in this, um, in this half hour or so is to basically first um, talk a little bit about uh, the, the background uh, and our research question, but also then go into definitions, the, the, the gap that we are trying to fill and our contribution. Um, just talk a little bit about our theory, methods and data, and then um, look more at the uh, analysis and, and, and get to some conclusions. So the, our kind of point of departure was to say, well, you know, um, we've seen this deadlock in the area of um, asylum policies. And so how can we um, make sense of it by looking at the dynamics, especially within the Council of the European Union, and especially the role that, that right-wing populist governments have played in EU policymaking in this uh, policy area. So um, in a way, what, what we are trying to argue here is that the deadlock in the this Dublin negotiations um, responds directly to the rise in populist forces on the domestic level. And this not just through populist governments, which of course have been crucial in, in causing this deadlock, but also by creating more kind of general pressures on um, member and member state governments. And to do that, what basically we do is take this, this um, case of the Dublin 4 regulation, so this regulation, uh, so this amendment to the Dublin system that was proposed after 2015 as a crucial case. First, because of course, Dublin is all about, um, about migration and we know that migration is, uh, is a topic um, that is very prone to populist capture, right? Because it mobilizes these issues of identity, this kind of us versus them. So this, this kind of pure people versus the others, the outsiders. So, um, so we know that migration is kind of a, a classical um, topic for, for um, populists. And also because of course, it's about redistribution of resources at the European Union level. And of course, that kind of enhances this anti-EU rhetoric. So it's also very prone to, to Eurosceptic capture, right? And we know that not all populists um, are Eurosceptics and not all Eurosceptics are populists, but still, of course, in this kind of anti-EU rhetoric, we have this, this idea of, the, of Brussels as the corrupt elite. Um, and this idea of the corrupt elite is very typical um, of uh, this populist uh, language, these populist uh, ideas. And this was very clear to see, for instance, when uh, we had all these discussions on the mandatory refugee quotas in 2015 and the role that the Visegrad four countries played into that. Um, and just so, so that, you know, to, to um, understand this, we focus very much on this process of deadlock um, that has happened uh, since summer 2018. So basically, in summer 2018, we, we had an, um, uh, an uh, European uh, Council where basically it was decided that, well, we are not going to agree on Dublin, so we are going to abandon negotiations on this issue. And so we look also not just at why this happened, but also what has happened since, so why it's been so difficult to undo this deadlock. Um, just very quickly, just to say a, a bit, you know, what, what we are studying. So as I was saying, we uh, focus on this kind of right-wing populist governments in the Council of the European Union. And um, that's a bit also because we focus a lot, and I myself have, have done this, on populists in the European Parliament, probably because it's more accessible and because it's easier to, to do. But actually, we haven't really... Uh, um, analyze so much how populists uh, um, act when they are in government. And, and we've seen that, of course, as we have now uh, in the recent years, some governments that are composed at least partially by populist parties. Um, and so we were interested in looking at their actions uh, within the council, also beyond these this typical issues of rule of law, which have been explored a bit, a bit further, but issues like asylum can be a slightly different area and we haven't paid that much attention to, to their uh, role in council, um, uh, the role of populist governments in council in this area. Um, 
by populism, I mean, we use this very classical um, uh, definition of Mude and Kalvasa. So basically this idea, as I was saying, of the pure people versus the corrupt elite, and this idea that politics should be an expression of the general will of the, of the people, right? And, um, and of course, in that sense, migration is a very typical issue here for, for populists. Um, and what we've seen, of course, is that um, right-wing populist uh, parties have tended to adopt very nativist positions. So they are very classical in this term of, of the, this us versus them. So, so this us, the, the pure people versus the, the outsiders. But this has also affected um, some, some governments even that are not classically right-wing populist, also some governments that are more left-wing or liberal. So, so it's not purely for um, part of a right-wing ideology, but it's something that we see more generally in, in populist parties. However, what we want to do in this paper is to really focus on the behavior of the Visegrad four countries. So Hungary, Poland, the Czech Republic and Slovakia. Slovakia being a country that had a very strong um, populist opposition and where then the government, even if it was not right-wing populist then took up this kind of uh, nativist positions. And Italy, um, which, um, which also played a, a crucial role in the Dublin four um, um, negotiations. Um, so we, we focus on these countries as kind of populist uh, governments. Uh, and basically what we want to contribute to is this, this, this uh, emerging uh, literature on bottom-up politicization. So basically, uh, of course, the, this post-functionalist post research has been going on now for, for quite a long time. Um, and it tells us a lot about this kind of um, constraining the census. So this idea that mass publics are more and more aware of what is going on in the European uh, Union. And of course, they constrain governments by uh, becoming more skeptical towards uh, what the European Union do, and then also what governments should be doing in the European Union. So they control more the governments, they are more aware of what is going on and they and they become also um, more, uh, so governments need to become more accountable towards people, towards the mass publics. Um, and so it's, it focused very much on this idea of politicization. And now here, this, this last couple of years, we've seen also that some people are trying to fill in this question of like, okay, so how is this link? How does this politicization work? Um, and, and so some people have been looking at this idea of bottom-up politicization and uh, at the role that, that some governments have in using this idea of assertive uh, politicization. So basically this idea that, that, that governments promote conflict and question fundamental values to basically get something at the EU level. So that they use this, this politicization at the domestic level to basically get something then on the European level. And Shimal Fennec, for instance, also uh, recently um, uh, discusses the issue of bottom up politicization. And he uh, said what, that you know, we should expect a non mainstream, uh, so this kind of challenger party, so for instance, populist parties, that they, sh we sh they should be, um, uh, we should expect them to be more uh, prone to using this kind of politicization strategies, uh, especially. If they are aligned with this tan, so with this nativist authoritarian side of this dal tan um, divide. However, this this was more an expectation, a hypothesis, and this is indeed something that that's exactly what we want to to test also here. So whether this is the case, right? So whether um, these kind of gover governments are indeed using more this kind of politicization strategies, and if yes, how and which kind of uh, strategies? And to do that, basically, we um, go back to game theory to demonstrate this, this kind of systematic difference in payoffs between populist and, and, and mainstream parties. Um, and we base our analysis on a set of uh, interviews. So we did interviews with uh, experts from the commission, the council, the permanent representations, European parliament, NGOs, already back in 2019. Uh, but we've, of course, complemented that also with EU documents, with uh, press releases, Eurobarometer, to also check for this kind of mass public uh, preferences um, and so on. 
And um, our methods are based basically, basically on qualitative content analysis and also this concurrence method where we basically are trying to see to what extent our um, data, our case fits with these expectations of um, game theory. So it's very kind of theory led, but also trying to develop new theory and, and, and build theory at the end. Just to give you a, um, a kind of a general idea of um, what happened in these negotiations, just just so um, to to explain a little bit the, the timeline of these negotiations, which have been going on for a long time and have been quite complicated. So in 2015, we had the, the, the refugee crisis, and then basically we had this attempt to have mandatory quotas to redistribute um, asylum seekers across uh, the European Union. As probably most of you know, <coughs> this didn't work. <coughs> Sorry. And, and then <coughs> we ended up in March with this EU-Turkey um, agreement uh, that kind of, um, in a way, tried to find, externalize this problem and, and kind of stop the arrivals uh, uh, into the European Union. And just after that, then the, the Commission proposed a, a, a huge package of uh, legislation, uh, which basically revised most of the existing um, uh, legislation that existed on asylum, um, on, on the asylum regime, so, so the common European asylum system. And of course, the main pillar in there was this, this Dublin 4 regulation, which basically updated what already existed, so the regulation that already existed. And one of the ideas, for instance, was to have this idea of a refugee relocation in times of high influx. So it was not a kind of um, a, a constant uh, relocation mechanism, but only in, ca in cases where there could be a very high influx of asylum seekers in a, in a country based on GDP, based on population, so that then there could be a mechanism that could activate uh, this relocation. Um, so uh, a year and a half later, then the, the, the Libre Committee, so the, the committee in the European Parliament, adopted a report. Um, and so the rapporteur, uh, Wikström, who's a, a liberal MEP, she uh, kind of went much further than the Commission and suggested that there should be an abolition of this first country of entry principle. So this idea that um, the, 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 the first country where an asylum seeker um, gets in then is responsible for their application. And which of course has been uh, one of the main issues with Dublin as we all know the situation in Greece and Italy and Malta and all these kind of frontline member states. Um, and during these uh, um, negotiations, and, and, and I'll, we come, I'll come back to this later, but uh, just to mention that, for instance, from Italy, the uh, Cinque Stelle uh, movement opposed uh, this idea. So they, they went uh, against this report and uh, Lega, so also the Italian Lega, abstained. So, uh, and we'll come back to that because it's, uh, it's an important part of the story. But then uh, basically this report was, uh, was um, approved by the, um, by the committee. And so it, it, it became basically this mandate for interinstitutional negotiations, which in the end did not happen because basically the council uh, did not want to start any negotiations. Um, and then uh, the Bulgarian presidency in kind of beginning of 2018, um, uh, tried to find a, a compromise within the, the Council that then ended up in this uh, European uh, Council in June 2018 when it was agreed to disagree and so basically ended up in deadlock. Since then, there have been uh, several attempts to, to undo this deadlock, and I'll come back to this in a second, but also just to note that um, last year the, the Commission presented also, also this kind of new migration pact, which in a way dissolved Dublin. So Dublin is not to be found uh, directly in this migration pact, which is again, a legislative package. But the main features remain in other kinds of legislation. So the, the, the idea of the first country of entry principle remains, and some of the, the mechanisms that were in Dublin remain. So in a way, it hasn't really been, um, the, the issue hasn't been solved. And again, this pact continues to be stuck in, in the council. So again, no, um, no solution there. 
All right. So, uh, I mean, one of the ways that we've been, uh, we've tried to make sense of why is it so difficult to find uh, this kind of responsibility sharing in asylum, and that's not just in Europe, but also on the international level, um, has been to, one way has been to use this kind of, of game theory and especially situation game. Um, and basically situation game, uh, and I'm not going to go too much into detail, but just to say that um, basically the situation game is saying that um, there are different incentives and there are very different payoffs uh, between the, the host, so the countries that do have a lot of asylum seekers and those that do not have that many asylum seekers. So basically, it's a very asymmetric relationship, one where basically um, those that do not host um, asylum seekers have no incentive uh, to uh, go for responsibility sharing. So they like the status quo, they do not want to uh, get more because they know that in any case, those that host asylum seekers will continue to do so. So um, in a way, they have no reason to do that. Um, and that's been exactly the dynamic we've seen in, in Dublin, where we've seen countries like the, the Visegrad for countries um, that have said, well, we are happy with the situation. We are not hosting um, asylum seekers and we do not want to do that. And so we have absolutely no incentive um, to basically move towards a responsibility sharing system. However, the literature tells us that there are ways, potential ways of overcoming these deadlock in situation games. One of them is that the host countries threat the um, uh, threat the, the non host So make, basically, they make it, for instance, very expensive not to host um, asylum seekers. Or they can also uh, make promises, for instance, through package deals, issue linkages, and so on. And so one way might be to alter the, the power symmetry. So maybe that they then win something from um, cooperating or water down the standards. So make it in a way cheaper uh, to, um, to cooperate. But of course, any sort of um, agreement, any sort of moves, uh, in this in this uh, in this game has to benefit both the host and the non-host, right? So it has to be Pareto optimal. So it cannot be that by altering um, by watering down the standards and the host also lose because then they are not going to agree to it. So there has to be still kind of an equilibrium, and that is basically what what has happened a little bit since the since this deadlock in two thousand eighteen. There have been um, several attempts to, uh, in a way, try to undo this deadlock. The, the first attempts were these kind of threats, right? And for instance, um, Emmanuel Macron, he, um, he kind of threatened Visegrad countries to exclude them from Schengen or exclude them from the cohesion funds, um, uh, which of course was not very credible, right? Because to, um, to exclude uh, someone from Schengen or to exclude them from the cohesion funds, we need unanimity and of course, or, or, or uh, that's not going to happen. The commission uh, adopted another strategy which, which was to say, well, you know, if you, and that was already in the, in the Dublin proposal, if you don't want to relocate, then it's going to be very expensive, right? So you have to uh, pay uh, to not host uh, asylum seekers. And so they basically tried to um, make the status quo too costly. And so um, by that, trying to convince them. And that, of course, didn't go down uh, very well. And that was also part of why in 2018, we had uh, this deadlock. Um, so then there were attempts to then go more in this line of like promises and package deals. Um, so uh, the, the, as we've seen that the, the, the Bulgarian presidency already tried to have this kind of package deals where it could be a little bit, I mean, where th there were some incentives uh, to cooperate, uh, but even um, doing that, but not to the, and, and for instance, that instead of having to pay 250,000, uh, euros, then they would have to pay maybe 25 or 35,000 euros uh, if they didn't accept, uh, accept someone. So, um, so there were some attempts already to, to make it a bit more attractive for these countries to accept Dublin. Um, there were also some, some 
um, some options to, to say, well, you know, we are going to um, have some sort of temporary uh, arrangement. So that we have some sort of cooperation and solidarity, but that in the short term, so that it, it it's only until we find an agreement that we have to uh, some sort of solutions, especially when we had all the issues of search and rescue and disembarkment in the Mediterranean. Uh, there was also some uh, proposals to have this kind of um, alternative measures to, of solidarity. Uh, so for instance, to say, well, you know, we are going to have uh, new proposals that reduce the duration of responsibility going from 10 to eight years, and then also have special rules for disembarkation. That was, for instance, a Franco-German proposal. Um, and also that you can pay into projects uh, for development in Africa. So that was this kind of Malta deal, but it didn't really take up. So it had to be, it was going to be voluntary and actually no one joined this, this proposal. And then some, some countries like Germany decided to go the bilateral way and say, well, you know, we are going to have like bilateral agreements, for instance, with Spain and Greece uh, to basically facilitate take uh, take back to these countries and this even outside of the dublin um, of the dublin scope or the dublin framework um, uh, but they were also not very effective right because the number of of people who were actually sent back to spain and greece was i mean ridiculous it was like 20 something people right or not even or maybe 30 people so it's uh, it's not really um, worth naming even that as a solution and what has been um, an effort over the years and which continues now to be an effort is this idea of decoupling, right? Of reducing the scope, uh, scope of the game by saying, well, you know, we decouple Dublin, which is very difficult from other solutions which might be feasible, like uh, introducing a new um, agency, uh, so asylum agency, or um, upgrading uh, Eurodac, which is this fingerprinting um, uh, database. Um, and that has been an attempt that has been going on now for years, and it has been repeated now, for instance, in uh, this summer. But again, there we have the parliament on the one side, and then also the frontline member states, which do not like this idea because they know that then you know uh, some countries might like very much to take the the, the good bits for them um, and not progress then on Dublin, right, or on uh, the more difficult uh, parts of the of the package. So that means that, of course, uh, right, so all of this has been for nothing. And again, everything is still very much deadlock. And our idea was to say, well, you know, one of the reasons might be that we are not in the same game. It's not really now a game between hosts and non hosts or not, not just, but it's more a game between non populists and populists. Um, and in this game, it's basically, it's not even a suasion game. It's, it's, it's a pure kind of deadlock game where, um, mutual defa defection dominates, right? So basically uh, for uh, the populists, they are always going to win and their prefer preferred uh, solution will be to defect, to basically not cooperate. And they actually thrive uh, from, from this conflict. And if you think in a populist, a populist way, right? So if, if accepting package deals or accepting some sort of halfway solutions, even if it might be, um, an advantage for them and for their country, it doesn't pay off because basically it's then kind of accepting the dictate of the Brussels elite. It's accepting uh, something that that, uh, that 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 comes from the outside. Is giving uh, giving in to these kind of mainstream forces. Is giving in on an issue of uh, of migration, right? So it's it's bad in terms of um, electoral dynamics. Um, because of they, they are seen as giving up both on the issue of migration and uh, on, on, on Europe, right, or EU integration. So in a way, what makes sense for them is to not accept the package deal and uh, to not accept any forms of, um, of cooperation. And that is a bit what we've seen um, uh, recently. So that uh, a bit the, this dynamics with uh, the Visegrad for countries and um, and, uh, and the Italian government, right? So um, for, for the Visegrad, for countries which would be populist non hos it's kind of logical, right? It's, it's, it's it, I mean, this, this game um, explains very well uh, their, their strategies and their dynamics. So we, we can understand why they continue to defect, um, even if 
the Bulgarian presidency, the commission, all uh, Germany, France and so on have repeatedly made efforts to accommodate them. And they kept saying no, 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 because of course for them, you know, it's, it's good. I mean, they have, uh, um, um, you know, they, 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 they gain vo votes by being Eurosceptic, they gain votes by being nativist. And so for them, it, it could just be bad to give up on that uh, and to give up on, on a conflict that actually um, has ensured their success for, for these um, recent years or, or partially, right? For the pub, uh, populist host, this is a bit more, more um, confusing, right? Because I mean, if we think for instance about uh, uh, Lega in Italy, uh, where basically um, Dublin is actually bad for Italy and we know it and the, the people know it and the people actually don't want and the Dublin um, system. But still, uh, Lega opposed um, opposed it, it, this this compromise on Dublin, partially in the European Parliament and uh, completely then later on in um, in the Council. So, in a way, um, it doesn't make sense. And our explanation was to say, well, you know, in a way criticizing the EU and blocking these negotiations and opposing these negotiations and uh, saying that it's it's not enough um, and so on. It's, it's a way for them to kind of keep this conflict alive and keep the issue of migration alive, right? So if there is a compromise, if there is a solution, then of course this disappears um, and that's not good uh, for for uh, uh, the Lega, and we've seen it also now a bit. You know that, that now that the issue of migration has done, gone down a bit, and it's more about coronavirus and so on. That that has of course affected um, the, the the electoral successes of Lega because it's not anymore so much about about the migration crisis, right? And we said, for yeah, instance, sorry to interrupt. You, just yeah, say five more I'll, minutes. Five more minutes. That should be fine. Thank you. Um, and I mean, we saw it also with Salvini and his reaction to the disembarkation crisis, right? That, that he, what he was saying all the time was, um, uh, we don't want to accept migrants that come uh, by boat uh, because this is, uh, you know, and this is for the good of the Italian people. I mean, we are, we are protecting the Italian people from all these migrants coming through the Mediterranean, right? So even if there were ideas on how to do this and how to maybe solve this issue, he was opposing any sort of cooperation and saying, no, no, we, Italy, we are going to do this on our own because that, that's how, how we do it. Um, so, of course, I mean, the, the, the changes in government in, in Italy kind of then pose a question of, okay, so Lega is not in government anymore. Why is it that then we we still don't have an agreement, right? And that that's what we are try, try, now trying to puzzle uh, out uh, um, in 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 this paper and trying to update this. And our idea was to say that, of course, it's not just about populist governments, but also what happens with mainstream governments, especially with mainstream hosts, right? So those that have high level of asylum seekers, and also probably a lot of pressure from populist challengers, that of course, um, they are also under pressure and that can also help to explain why these issues don't progress uh, in the council. And in a way, what has happened now in Afghanistan shows very well that, that there is this niche reaction, right? That um, we see uh, uh, a conflict outside and the first reaction was to say, oh, we shouldn't repeat 2015, right? And that, came, for instance, from the German government um, and not just populist governments, which also kind of raise uh, their voices. And Austria, for instance, is a very good example of that as well. Um, but also what we were trying to look more into now and maybe also try to bring in here as well is about institutional norms and cultures, right? And, and, and we were trying to, in a way, compare also what happened in the European Parliament, where even if we, if, if we had also this kind of political parties and parties in government, populist parties in government, they still managed to find uh, um, a majority and, and kind of a mainstream majority, while in the council, this has been impossible. And our argument was to say, well, you know, in the parliament, you can kind of, um, really work as a majoritarian institution, split up the parties if needed, so isolate uh, Fidesz within the, the EPP back then, um, ignore the, the populists in, in the more radical parties. In the council, you cannot do that. And especially because there's this culture of, of uh, consensus that also these parties actually exploit, right? So um, 
So Orban, for instance, exploited this idea of we need to decide by consensus, and by consensus he meant unanimity. That kind of makes it even more complicated to move away from, from, from this consensus, uh, um, from this uh, status quo, and find any, any uh, sort of solution. So just to conclude very quickly, I mean, we, we, what we um, are arguing here is that really what we've seen in the in the in this uh, in these negotiations and what we're seeing in in probably more broadly, and that's something that we would of course need to um, determine also in other policy fields is this conflict as as the dominant strategy of populist actors, right? So feeding from conflict um, and not being willing to even if they try to say while well, consensus is important, not really being um, uh, kind of keen on finding some sort of agreement or consensus. It's they, they, uh, they, they live from this uh, conflict and they win from this conflict. And that of course makes it then um, very difficult to find any sort of decisions. It, it kind of makes leaving the status quo much more complicated, especially in, in institutions like the, the Council and the European Council. And of course, the shadow that the European Council sheds on the Council um, when it comes to, uh, to finding some sort of policy change. Um, and another point that we wanted to make is about this relationship between politicization and and this kind of assertive use of politicization. And what we are trying to say here is that, well, in some cases, yes, but in some cases, it's really, it goes beyond this, this constraining dissensus, right? So sometimes there is no dissensus back home, um, or at least not about, about, um, about working together on the European Union level and still um, they use politicization because it benefits them as a party, right? Um, and the final point is just what we're discussing, right, about also the impact that this has on non-populist governments, um, and, and especially in host countries, and how, of course, for them, even if it's not exactly, and they might not feed uh, from, from this conflict as much as populist actors, it's also very difficult to um, undo uh, these situations and not to fall back also on, on this kind of parroting uh, strategies and copying what populists do um, back home. And I'll leave it there. I hope it was almost five minutes, maybe six. <laughs> Thank you.